from Marsha Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, which brings you this weekly series every fall and every spring. Um, I will let you know this is the closing program of our fall semester series, and we will resume our programs on the 23rd of January. Our program today is called What's Ahead for Healthcare Reform? Now that the Supreme Court and the voters have weighed in. Since passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act in 2010, this particular road to health care reform in the United States has been riddled with political potholes and subject to legislative and judicial slowdowns. But with the Supreme Court's landmark stamp of constitutional approval last June, and we hear that some form of Obamacare is here to stay, well, at least for the next four years. Indeed, repeal of the Affordable Care Act may no longer be the top Republican priority, as House Speaker John Boehner noted last Thursday, quote, the election changes that. Obamacare is the law of the land, unquote. So what's ahead as we implement the Affordable Care Act? In our Medical Center Hour today, we're fortunate to have Washington and Lee Law Professor and Affordable Care Act expert Timothy Jost and UVA health policy analyst Carolyn Engelhardt. They're here to outline what must be accomplished in order to realize this very ambitious overhaul of our healthcare system. Timothy Stoltzfus Jost is the Robert L. Willett Family Professor of Law at Washington and Lee in nearby Lexington. And Carolyn Engelhardt, an assistant professor of medical education, directs the health policy program for our Department of Health of Public Health Sciences. You'll find some short biographical sketches of both speakers in your handout. There's also a resource list uh, in your handout. In the wake of the election, our speakers have had a week to think about how the Affordable Care Act's implementation will figure in the health policy agendas, political and otherwise, of the second Obama administration and the states, including the Commonwealth of Virginia. One thing is clear, there's a very great deal of work to be done, um, and some of it needs to start right away. Both speakers completed conflict of interest disclosure forms. Neither has declared any financial conflict of interest. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank our several partners in co who are co-sponsoring this Medical Center Hour with us, the Sadie Lewis Webb Program of Law and Health from the School of Law, the Institute for Practical Ethics and Public Life, the Department of Public Health Sciences, and the Bioethics and Health Policy Medical Student Interest Group. Um, and now, without further delay, Tim Jost and then Carolyn Engelhardt. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to speak this morning uh, some about the future, but also a lot about the past of the Affordable Care Act, um, sort of the history of the, of the entire thing. Um, and I thank you very much for the invitation to be here today, and uh, it's, it's good to be here to see some old friends here. On March 23rd, 2010, over two and a half years ago, President Obama, oh, I'm going to have to look at my slides. I'm an old law professor, so I don't use slides much, but um, I know I was talking to some a medical audience, so that I have to bring some. <laughs> A few days later, the president signed the health care, and uh, on, on March 23, 2010, over two and a half years ago, President Obama signed into law the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. A few days later, he signed into law the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act, and the two <coughs> bills together, known as the Affordable Care Act, or by some as Obamacare, when fully implemented, will bring about a greater change in our health care system than any other federal legislation in history except that which created Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. Nevertheless, I would not characterize the Affordable Care Act as revolutionary. Indeed, in many respects, it is quite conservative in the sense that it conserves and expands on our pre-existing health care system, trying to build on its strengths and strengthen its weaknesses. The legislation that was adopted in the spring of 2010 was the lowest common denominator acceptable to the most conservative Democratic members of the Senate and moderate Democrats in the House. Only when at the last moment President Obama issued an executive order clarifying that the ACA would not fund abortion did it finally get enough votes to pass. 
Moreover, as the legislation was drafted in committee in the summer of 2009, heroic efforts were made, over to, made to win over Republican votes for the legislation. In its markup of the reform legislation in June and July of 2009, the Senate Health, Education, and Labor Committee adopted 161 Republican amendments in whole or in revised form. In the words of John McDonough, a key Senate staffer who worked on the bill, Republican ideas, and I quote, permeate the ACA. The individual mandate was embraced and brought, was advanced and broadly embraced by Republicans in the Clinton area, in era, including Senators Hatch and Grassley. Private market subsidies to purchase private insurance was another cornerstone of the 1993 Republican alternative. No public plan option was a persistent Republican demand. The young invincible catastrophic coverage option was a Senator Snow priority. Allowing consumers and businesses to buy health insurance across state lines was a priority for nearly every Republican member." End quote. With the Tea Party Revolution of August 2009, however, Republican support for reform evaporated. But by then, the legislation was basically set. Indeed, if anything, it drifted to the right, as conservative senators like Ben Nelson and Mary Landro and the Blue Dogs in the House were courted. The resulting legislation was built on basic principles that have been associated with conservative advocacy organizations and scholars. First, expansion of access for middle-income Americans is based on extending private health insurance rather than on building a new public system. Second, expansion of coverage for this group is accomplished through the use of tax credits rather than direct payments. Third, health insurance exchanges will be used to encourage managed competition between insurers to bring down costs, an idea long championed by certain conservative economists. Fourth, the problem of the cost of healthcare services is addressed through attempts to make markets function better rather than through price controls. Fifth, assistance for the truly needy is provided through the means-tested federal state Medicaid program rather than through social insurance. Sixth, there is no direct rationing of healthcare. Seventh, the states will have the option of managing much of the program themselves to avoid the creation of the federal bureaucracy. Many of these same principles are reflected in Paul Ryan's Roadmap for America, and several were championed by the Romney campaign, although characteristically, Romney offered for few details. Because the reform legislation was basically conservative legislation adopted by a Democratic Congress over stiff Republican opposition, the law has never enjoyed majority support uh, of the American people. There has always been a substantial minority, about a quarter of those who have opposed the law, who believe that the law did not go far enough. The opposition to the law has been from both the right and the left. Nevertheless, virulent attacks from the right beginning in 2009 challenged the law as a socialist takeover of our health care system. Blatant lies about the content of the legislation have continued to circulate on the internet while the right-wing media has continued to present a distorted vision of the law. Poll after poll shows that the public is very badly misinformed regarding the ACA. Recent polling, for example, showed that 30% of seniors in fact believe that the Affordable Care Act establishes death panels, while 38% believe that the law cuts benefits for Medicare beneficiaries, while it in fact expands them. Even more unfortunately, surveys show that half of Americans are unaware of reforms that the law includes. Easy to read and compare summaries of health insurance plans or access to preventive services without cost sharing are, are, are fewer than half of the, of the population realize those are in the law, even though 70 to 80 percent of Americans support these reforms. The Republican opposition from the outset identified the ACA, or rather their distorted picture of it, as one of its primary weapons for regaining control of the White House and of Congress, and has used it to full effect in the election. The House has voted over 30 times to repeal the law, although the Senate has consistently blocked repeal efforts. But as the law has been implemented, many Americans like what they see, although they continue to be concerned about the future. Within days of the President's signature in 2010, several of the ACA's stopgap reforms were implemented. The pre-existing condition high-risk pool was implemented in about half the states by state government and the other half by the federal government. 
Although enrollment has been a fraction of what was expected, tens of thousands of Americans have signed up for the pre-existing condition high-risk pool, uh, and they have tended to be persons with great health needs for whom this coverage is a lifesaver. The small employer tax credit, again, was taken up by far fewer employers than was expected, but has cushioned the rapid decline in small employer coverage that is otherwise taking place. The early retiree reinsurance program, on the other hand, has been oversubscribed and has proven to be a huge, although largely unnoticed, benefit to state and local government at a time when they have otherwise been under severe financial distress. distress. At the six-month anniversary of the law, a number of other reforms went into effect. These included the extension of parental coverage for adult children up to age 26, which has now covered 3.1 million members of this group, which was previously the age group least likely to have insurance coverage and is, was even less likely at this time uh, to be insured because of the high unemployment in this age group. Uh, I would imagine some people in this room are covered under this provision, and I am very glad that my son, who has a very serious chronic disease and has graduated from college, uh, continues to be insured because of this provision. All health plans were required to offer internal and external appeals of coverage decisions, and insurers were prohibited from rescinding coverage except for fraud. Insurers were required to cover preventive services without cost sharing, and to eliminate lifetime and limit annual dollar limits. The September reforms went smoothly on the whole, although one of the reforms, eliminating pre-existing condition clauses for children, resulted in widespread disruption of the child-only coverage market, portending problems for uh, the future implementation of the general prohibition on pre-existing conditions clauses in 2012. Further reforms were implemented in 2011 and 2012 including provisions requiring insurers to justify unreasonable rate increases, to pay rebates to consumers if they spent less than 80 or 85 percent of their premium revenues on health plans and quality improvement expenses, and most recently, within the last couple of months, a requirement that they issue easily read and comparable summaries of benefits and coverage. This summer, 12.8 million Americans included, had received $1.1 billion in rebates from uh, insurance companies because of the medical loss ratio provisions. Health care costs have grown at historically low rates over the last two years. You have to go back to the Eisenhower administration to find times when health care costs have grown as slowly as they have in the last two years. Little of that is probably attributable to the ACA. But more importantly, insurance premiums have gone, grown more slowly as well. And I think the ACA has to get some credit for that, particularly because of more aggressive rate review and because of the medical loss ratio rule holding down administrative costs. Of course, other ACA reforms have come into place as well, including the expansion of Medicare preventive care services, first cash rebates, and then brand name drug discounts in the donut hole, an expansion of Medicaid in some states. Reforms in health care delivery encouraged by the Affordable Care Act have also begun, including the formation of now over 150 accountable care organizations. The three departments tasked with implementing the ACA, HHS, Treasury, and Labor, have issued a steady stream of proposed and final regulations implementing both the current reforms and laying the groundwork for the 2014 reform. For finally, virtually all the states have taken some action towards reform implementation, amending state laws to accommodate the 2010 insurance reforms, uh, accepting federal grants to retool Medicaid eligibility systems, many of which date back for decades, and in about a third of the states, preparing for full implementation of the exchanges and other reforms in 2014. Minutes after the reform, uh, uh, was signed into law, however, a dozen states led by Florida filed a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the law. The Commonwealth of Virginia filed a separate lawsuit challenging the law as well, and in the end about 30 cases were filed challenging the law's constitution, uh, constitutionality. A dozen of these reached the federal appellate courts, and certiorari was sought in the Supreme Court for six of them. A few of these remain pending, 
Most of these cases challenge the constitutionality of Congress uh, adopting the Affordable Care Act's individual responsibility provision, but many raised other constitutional claims as well. These included due process, equal protection, freedom of association, right of privacy, Tenth Amendment commandeering, free exercise and establishment clause issues, as well as constitutional challenges to the process through which the ACA was adopted and the authority of Congress to adopt the employer responsibility provisions. Some of these claims went even further afield, such as a claim that the ACA denied men equal protection by creating five offices of women's health, but no office of men's health, uh, or a claim that the defendants had breached their, quote, duties contained within their oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution, end quote. One case even raised a birther claim. In fact, this guy kind of went around the country filing lawsuits saying that the law was invalid because President Obama was not an American citizen. A number of these cases were dismissed because the plaintiff had not alleged an injury sufficient to claim standing or failed to make a plausible claim of a violation of the right. But many of them, including a couple of cases involving religious liberty claims, were taken very seriously and thoroughly analyzed by the courts. In the end, three district courts and one court of appeal held that the individual responsibility provision was unconstitutional. Two courts of appeal upheld the individual mandate, however, with both of those decisions being, uh, having decisions written by well-respected conservative judges. Other courts of appeal dismissed the ACA claims on procedural grounds, but the issue finally reached the Supreme Court late last year. In the end, as we all know, the Supreme Court upheld the individual responsibility <coughs> provision, but the decision was a complete surprise to most of those who were following the case. The majority opinion was written by Chief Justice Roberts. He began by stating that Congress lacks the constitutional authority to adopt the individual responsibility provision under the Commerce Clause since it compelled rather than regulated activity. This was as far as CNN and Fox got before they started reporting that the law was unconstitutional, causing confusion for several minutes. I think CNN stuck with that for about seven minutes before somebody told them they were wrong. Um, Fox caught on a little faster. But the Chief Justice proceeded to decide that Congress had properly adopted the requirement under its taxing power, as the ACA does not in fact force Americans to purchase health insurance, but rather taxes uninsured individuals who can afford health insurance and do not otherwise fall within exceptions to the requirement, but who nonetheless refuse to purchase health insurance. The Department of Justice had argued repeatedly below that the requirement could be upheld under the taxing power, but this argument had been rejected by most of the lower courts. Most observers, therefore, were surprised that the Chief Justice agreed with this argument in fact, however, the court has interpreted the taxing power very broadly in the past, and the decision was not particularly novel. The biggest surprise was the court's next holding, however. The Chief Justice, joined by Justice Breyer and Kennedy, held that the Affordable Care Act unconstitutionally coerced the states into expanding Medicaid coverage by threatening the loss of existing Medicaid funding if states did not participate in the Medicaid expansion. Chief Justice Roberts went on to hold, however, that the Medicaid expansion itself was constitutional as an option and that the rest of the ACA remained enforceable, including the terms of the expansion for the states, that, excluding the terms of the expansion for the states that chose to participate. In sum, the court upheld the Affordable Care Act but made the Medicaid expansion optional with the states rather than mandatory. It was a near thing, however. The four Republican appointees, uh, other than the Chief Justice, filed a joint dissent in which they stated that both the individual responsibility provisions and the Medicaid expansion were unconstitutional and that therefore the entire law would have to be thrown out. The ramifications of the Chief Justice joining them and striking down this law I think would have been breathtaking. Not only would a Republican court have struck down the signature accomplishment of a Democratic President and Congress as unconstitutional, really for the first time since the 1930s. But the decision would have propelled our healthcare system into chaos. For one thing, payment of Medicare providers and managed care plans would have had to stop until new payment regulations could have been rewritten based on the prior law, 
since current payment regulations incorporate changes for the, uh, made by the ACA. The status of the reforms already in effect and payments made through programs already operational, as well as several hundreds of millions of dollars already paid to the states, would have had to be sorted out. Perhaps it was the realization of this that convinced the Chief Justice to uphold the law. It has been rumored that his original inclination was to join the other Republican appointees in striking it down. In the end, the most important <coughs> ramification of this litigation is political. The 2014 reforms asked the states to establish exchanges, risk adjustment, and reinsurance programs and to implement the market reforms. The federal government has fallback authority, but the hope of Congress was that the states would move forward. We have lost two years now in the implementation by the states of the exchanges. The 26 states that sued claiming the ACA was unconstitutional were hardly in a position to press ahead aggressively with implementation. Some moved ahead quietly, trying to put themselves in position to implement the law where it upheld. A handful moved ahead at least for a while, stating that independent of the law, they thought that the exchanges were a good idea. But most of the plaintiff states stopped implementation pending resolution of the case, thus losing valuable time. Moreover, the media coverage of the litigation, which focused much more on the lower court's decisions that struck down the law than on those that upheld it, encouraged its opponents and put pressure on the states that might have been willing to cooperate with implementation. The 2010 elections brought dramatic changes to the states, which went from 52 state legislative chambers controlled by Democrats and 33 by Republicans to 53 controlled by Republicans and 32 by Democrats. In addition, five governorships changed hands, leaving 29 states in Republican hands. In many states, moreover, the Republican Party moved radically to the right, threatening moderate Republican state leaders and congressmen who thought of cooperating with the ACA. Some, including myself, hoped that the decision upholding the statute would bring recalcitrant states around. But most of the states that had been awaiting the decision remained obdurate, now putting their hopes on the election. Recalcitrant states have also complained that they don't have enough guidance from the administration to move forward, and the administration has slowed its output of guidance as the election is neared, presumably to avoid kicking up new controversies. It must be noted, however, that the states that want to move forward are finding that they have enough information to do so. The Supreme Court decision, of course, opened a new front for federal-state confrontation, um, and that is the Medicaid expansions. Few expected that the Supreme Court would find the expansion unconstitutional. Both the District Court and the Court of Appeals had upheld it, even though uh, they had struck down the individual responsibility provision. Indeed, the theory on which the states challenge it was based on dicta in two earlier Supreme Court cases and had never before been relied on by any federal court at any level to strike down a federal law. It's unclear exactly what the decision means. Apparently, the confluence of three factors, the Chief Justice's conclusion that the expansion resulted in a change in kind and not merely in degree in Medicaid, the fact that the states that refused to expand were threatened with the loss of all of their Medicaid funding, and the fact that Medicaid accounts for 20% of state budgets and is the largest source of federal funding for the states, convinced the Chief Justice and six other justices that the Medicaid expansion uh, was unconstitutionally coercive. When, if ever, this holding will be applied again remains to be seen. I expect that we will see a lot of litigation over the next few years involving cooperative federal state programs, uh, but I would be surprised if the Supreme Court ever again holds uh, a, a program coercive on this basis. But this does mean that states get to choose whether to participate in the expansion or not. Several Republican governors proclaimed immediately that their states would not participate. There are many reasons, however, to believe that in the end, if the expansions remain in the law, most, if not all, states will participate, maybe not in 2014, but at some point thereafter. The Medicaid expansions are accompanied by 100% federal funding for the first three years, phasing down to 90% by 2020. 
The Affordable Care Act offers no other means for covering adults with incomes below 100% of poverty other than those that can be covered through traditional Medicaid. Resisting states effectively intensify the huge uncompensated care burden faced by their hospitals, which will at the same point be facing cuts in Medicare and Medicaid disproportionate share funding, which otherwise would have subsidized uncompensated care. Other health industry players will also be deprived of important revenues, including managed care companies, which stood to make literally tens of billions of dollars a year off of the expansion. Medicaid managed care is one of the biggest growth areas right now for, um, for managed care companies, which see their commercial markets shrinking. Indeed, there's good evidence that overall the changes in Medicaid will save rather than cost money to the states. Residents of states that don't expand with incomes below 138% of poverty will be able to get premium tax credits, but they will have to pay for part of the cost of their health insurance and if they don't purchase it, will face the individual mandate penalty. If their employers do provide coverage and they get premium, and don't, excuse me, do not provide coverage and they get premium tax credits, the employer will face a penalty as well. This would not be true if the employee received Medicaid. And residents of states that do not expand will still be paying federal taxes to cover the expansion in states that do expand. At this state, at this point, the states are under no immediate pressure to decide on the Medicaid expansions, but that decision will need to be made well before 2014. With the Supreme Court decision in hand, all eyes turns towards the election. <laughs> President Obama's re-election and the election of additional Democratic members of the House and Senate must be viewed in part as a referendum on the Affordable Care Act. Exit polls showed that a slim plurality of voters supported the ACA and that a distinct minority favored repeal. And there's a Kaiser Health poll out this morning that shows that the percentage that favor appeal has fallen even further uh, over the last few months. President Obama did not run away from the ACA in his re-election campaign, and the Republicans continued to attack it, with Governor Romney promising to work towards repeal with the first day of office. The president's re-election, therefore, must be seen as a green light to move forward toward 2014. With President Obama re-elected and the Democrats retaining control of the Senate, what happens next? I'm the topic you asked me to speak on. There is every reason to believe that health reform implementation will proceed. The exchanges will begin open enrollment on October 1, 2013, signing up millions of uninsured Americans with incomes below 400% of the poverty level for premium tax credits. Millions of additional Americans will be enrolled in Medicaid in states that choose to expand the Medicaid program to cover their residents with incomes at or below the 138% of poverty level beginning on January 1, 2014, again with 100% federal funding. Insurers will no longer, as of January 1, 2014, be able to impose pre-existing condition clauses and will need to insure all applicants regardless of health status. Gender and health status discrimination in premiums will no longer be legal. Insurers in the individual and small group market will be required to offer an essential health benefits package covering maternity and mental health care, for example, which often are not covered very well now to the individual and small group market. Insurers will be prohibited from imposing dollar limits on coverage, and consumers will be protected from medical expenses exceeding out-of-pocket limits. Individuals who can afford health insurance but fail to purchase it will have to pay a tax, minuscule at first but becoming significant over time. Large employers who fail to insure their employees will also face a freeloader tax if their employees end up getting uh, pr uh, publicly subsidized insurance through the exchanges. But we will begin to see changes long before 2014. Between now and 2014, a great deal of work needs to be done. The exchanges must begin open enrollment on October 1, 2013. Before that date, the exchanges have to have certified qualified health plans. But before health plans can be certified, insurers must have their rates and forms approved by the states. And before that can happen, insurers must determine what plans they will offer and what premiums they will charge. Yet insurers cannot establish their plans and set their rates until they know a great deal more than they do now 
about the rules they're going to have to play by. If you follow the timeline of these tasks backwards, you get very close to the present. Within the next few days, we can expect a flood of um, health care reform proposed and then final rules, as well as further guidance regarding rules already released. The Department of Health and Human Service sent proposed rules over to the Office of Man Management and Budget on Thursday of last week. Uh, it is expected that those could come out as early as today, although I haven't checked my BlackBerry for the last few minutes, but I think it's probably a little late in the day for those to come out, but maybe tomorrow. Probably by the, I'm thinking the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, they like to do things when no one's paying attention. Um, <laughs> rules are urgently needed explaining how the age and geographic rating are supposed to work on the new reforms, for example. Health insurers need more information as to how actuarial value of plans will be calculated and how the risk adjustment, reinsurance, and risk order programs will operate before they can price their products for 2014. In particular, insurers need to know what the benchmark essential health benefits plan will be for each state. The states were supposed to have reported to HHS by September 30th of 2012 what uh, essential health benefits would be included in their package. Uh, every insurer is supposed to cover 10 essential health benefits, but they're things like hospital care, outpatient care, prescription drugs. Uh, and so uh, HHS, uh, rather than coming up with their own list, asked the states to each pick a plan from a menu of plans, uh, the three largest small group plans in the state, the three largest state employee benefit plans, et cetera. Uh, to pick a plan which would then be the benchmark which all other uh, insurers would have to key to to make sure that they cover the essential health benefits. Uh, about half the states have chosen a benchmark plan, the remainder have not. HHS can designate a fallback plan for these states, the largest small group plan in the state, but would prefer that the state picks the benchmark plan. Rep reportedly, HHS will publish a proposed rule, again probably in the next few days, including each state's benchmark, and the states will have an opportunity to comment, essentially getting a second bite and making the decision as to what their benchmark plan should be. The states must decide by Friday, the day after tomorrow, whether they will operate their own exchange, but have, have as of last week, been given until mid-December to submit their plans, and until mid-February to decide whether they want to operate uh, a partnership exchange with the federal government. Presumably, at this point, most states are opting for the federal exchange. There are only about 15 states plus the District of Columbia that have clearly indicated they're moving forward with a state exchange. But there may well be some surprises now that Obama's been reelected and the states are faced with the stark choice of having to either pull something together at the state level or advocate for the feds. At the very least, it is likely that some states will opt for partnership exchanges. Uh, taking over their uh, uh, taking over the regulation of their insurance markets without taking ownership of the tax credits and penalties. We need to know soon a great deal about what the federal exchange will look like. My assumption is that it will be a pretty stripped down operation, basically a website and call centers. But the, uh, the federal exchange must certify qualified health plans for participation and enroll individuals in these plans and in the federal premium tax credit and cost sharing reduction programs. This is going to be a massive job. The federal government has actually a lot of experience with running exchanges with Medicare Part C and D and the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program, but this will be its biggest exchange yet. The federal government will also bear responsibility for paying advanced premium tax credits and cost sharing reduction payments for two insurers and for auditing the reconciliations that must occur with regard to these tax credits at the end of the year. The federal government will be primarily responsible for enforcing the individual and employer mandate and will have to implement reporting systems to make these programs work. Finally, the federal government, or more particularly the Office of Personnel Management, must put together a multi-state program to ensure that individuals throughout the United States have a meaningful choice of plans uh, in all states. Um, finally, the states bear, will bear primary responsibility for enforcing the market reforms. They will need to review the forms and rates filed by insurers to assure compliance with the new law 
and for reviewing the marketing and claims practices of insurers to ensure that, uh, that they are in compliance. The federal government also has authority to enforce the law, but only in states that substantially fail to do so themselves. In some states, the market reforms will require changes in legislation. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which I work with as a consumer representative, is currently working on model legislation toward that end. Indeed, securing cooperation from the states on health care reform generally promises to be a major headache for the Obama administration going forward. The Republicans picked up at least one, uh, one governorship in uh, North Carolina in this last election and, uh, and made some gains in some state houses, although they lost, I think they lost five state houses and gained three. Alabama, Montana, and Wyoming passed anti-Obamacare amendments to their constitutions, although Florida defeated a similar measure. These measures are purely symbolic, with the Supreme Court having decided that the ACA is constitutional and thus the supreme law of the land, but they do symbolize continued resistance to the red states. Um, the administration will have to confront the resistance firmly, but also work together with practically minded Republican state officials to make the ACA work for all Americans. And I should say that I've been working with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners for a couple of years now, and I've been very impressed with, uh, even though uh, most of them uh, are not big supporters of this law, they do take a very practical to it. They do realize this is the supreme law of the land, and uh, the insurance commissioners, almost to a person, are, I think, uh, willing uh, to work together to, to make this law work. Of course, the exchanges, insurance reforms, premium tax credits, and Medicaid expansions are only a fraction of the Affordable Care Act. Other sections address Medicare payment reform, prevention and workforce reforms, fraud and abuse, the generic pathway for biosimilars, and other uh, issues. Some of these reforms, such as the development of accountable care organizations, are moving forward. Some programs are not yet funded and may never be. But the Affordable Care Act is making changes across the face of the health care, of health care, and with the re-election of the president will continue to do so. Finally, a major threat facing ACA implementation is the bargaining the president must engage in with Congress over the budget, tax <coughs> legislation, deficit reduction, and probably to some people in this room, most importantly, the Medicare sustainable growth rate fix. Although the Democrats made gains in the Senate, the Republicans retained firm control of the House, and the evisceration of the ACA is likely to remain high on their agenda. Republicans are likely to focus on finding cuts from the ACA to fund the Medicare uh, physician payment increases, for example, as they have done in the past. There is, frankly, I believe, little room to cut in the Affordable Care Act if it is to accomplish its goal of offering health insurance to the uninsured. I believe the administration must be firm and vigilant in protecting the premium tax credits and Medicaid funding if we are, in fact, to significantly expand coverage in 2014, and I believe it has a mandate for the American people to do that. In conclusion, November 6th was a good night for health care reform and for the millions of Americans who will benefit from it, but a great deal of work needs to be done before the reform becomes a reality, and much of it must be done in the next few weeks. It is time for the administration to roll up its sleeves and get to work. Thank you. It's great to see folks I know, friends, neighbors, students, colleagues. I'd like to thank Marcia Childress for including me in this program and say how delighted I am to be here with Tim Jost. Tim is, as you could tell, really involved in what's going on in the ACA. I mean, he's sitting on groups that will really make a difference about how it rolls out. And if you have not had the chance to read his writings on the health affairs blog, I suggest that you do so because they're, it's a wonderful way to keep up 
and to also get background about the legislation. Okay, so I just have a couple of minutes with you so we can open up for questions. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the election itself. So, what did the election tell us? Was it a mandate on the ACA? I don't know about you, but I can finally now turn on my television again and actually watch it without having these interminable negative ads about uh, the candidates. Listening to these ads, you would think that the choice was between uh, an overreaching big government president, uh, you know, committed to wealth redistribution to fund some sort of socialistic fill in the blank against a laissez faire candidate who wanted only to have tax cuts for the wealthy and um, protect uh, big business. In, in fact, that's very, it's hyperbolic. Of course, it's somewhere in the middle. And so the question then becomes, what does this say about the ACA? And did the ACA, what did the election tell us? Well, certainly it got caught in that discussion. It got caught in the maelstrom and became a symbol of big government. Um, before the election, uh, Bob Linden at Harvard, uh, condu who conducts surveys, has for the last 30 years, said that for the first time in a long time, healthcare and, and Medicare were the number two most popular issues in voters' minds. Um, in the past, it'd been, they'd been third or fourth. So we knew it was important going in. As Tim mentioned, the exit polls suggested that after the election, the, I don't know if we could say favorability, but maybe the lack of unfavorability changed. Since the law was passed, most Americans have been evenly split, with more Americans being less favorable about the health care bill than favorable for it. So um, a question then becomes, did they, did they go to the polls supporting the ACA? Well, I'm not sure. I think the fact that the Kaiser poll yesterday came out and showed that Americans now, fewer Americans now want to repeal the law suggests that we're in a, a time of either Americans, maybe like John Boehner, have finally come around to thinking that it was a fait accompli and that the ACA will go forward. Maybe it's just Obamacare fatigue and people are just tired of thinking about it and talking about it. Um, uh, or it may suggest support, but I'd like to submit and have you think uh, that it might be something else. Um, there's a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute named Henry Olson. Uh, the American Enterprise Institute had a webinar a few days after the election, and he had very thoughtful uh, remarks regarding a different set of exit poll questions. There were four questions that asked Americans what they desired in a president, what qualities they <coughs> desired in a president. And the first three had to do with personal values and who would be the better leader and who reflected uh, economic issues better. And for those first three questions, Governor Romney came out ahead of, of the president. But the fourth question asked um, voters about this uh, quality and voters said that, um, excuse me, I'm trying to find this. The exact wording was, who do you think of the candidates is someone who cares about people like you? And the president came, won that one by 81 to 15. So perhaps, perhaps the election had something to do with what Americans want for their president. They might be signaling something a little bit more fundamental that they value a president who espouses um, a limited government and a role for a limited government with perhaps not a hand off, and not, excuse me, not a hand out, but a hand up, particularly when we've just come out of a terrible recession and we've just seen many, many, how many hundreds of people, thousands of people still don't have power because of the hurricane. So it may be very well that Americans were making a comment about the kind of president that they wanted and President Obama was more that way than Governor Romney. Oops, sorry about that. 
Okay, secondly, who were the voters in this election? So you may not know this, but of all the developed countries, the U.S. has the lowest voting rate. Does anybody here know who has the highest? It's Australia. Now, it may also be because Australia actually finds you if you don't vote. <laughs> that might be something we might try in the future. But here in the U.S., in a good year, in a good presidential election, we'll see 50 to 60 percent of uh, eligible voters actually voting. Now, think about that. In a very close election, as they always are, what does that mean? It means that about three out of 10 of us are choosing the future president. That's kind of interesting when you think about it, isn't it? So who were those voters? Well, you've probably been reading this in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or listening to it on TV, so I won't belabor it, but generally the, the voters really were very different for each of the candidates. So for President Obama, they tended to be made up of women, particularly unmarried women. 62% of unmarried women voted for the president. The gender gap in this election was the largest gender gap uh, that Gallup has ever seen since it began its tracking. It was a 20 point gender gap. 10% of the voters for the president were Latino um, and they voted heavily, 71% for the president. Same for African Americans, uh, Asians, the fastest growing ethnic group, uh, voted 73% for Obama, 67% of young voters voted for the president, and 76% uh, of gay, lesbian, and bisexual voters. That's who supported the president. Who supported Governor Romney? Well, men, particularly white men over the age of 45, particularly those uh, people, individuals who were conservatives, who were southerners, who were evangelical Christians, and who were married. So you can see, and, and if you look at Virginia, we are a microcosm of that split. You would see very similar uh, differences in the way people voted. So what does this have to do with the Affordable Care Act? Well, we could argue that women, who typically are the health navigators for their families, may have voted for the president because, like Tim, maybe they have their young adult children on their health insurance plan, Maybe they have uh, parents uh, on Medicare and they've seen that the donut hole is shrinking uh, under the ACA and that seniors have received quite a few benefits already with preventive services and other things that um, the ACA brought in. It may be that uh, Hispanics and African Americans who dispro disproportionately make up the uninsured were hoping that the ACA would bring them some relief from that. But it also might have to do with the president's more liberal stand on immigration reform, reproductive policy, and gay rights. Okay, finally, this is um, um, this is a a word a wordle um, of a, of a speech that the president made on health reform just three weeks before the election. Um, and I'll get back to that in a minute. I just would like to say that the uh, ACA has had three near-death experiences. The first one came when Scott Brown was elected to fill Senator Ted Kennedy's seat shortly after the Senate version of the ACA was passed, thus depriving the Senate of the 60 votes that were needed to overcome a filibuster. Many of us watching this thought, this is it for the seventh time in a century. We've gotten really close, but we just aren't going to make it. But because of Nancy Pelosi and some, one might say, legislative shenanigans, parliamentary rules, reconciliation, the ACA survived. Uh, the second near miss came this summer during the Supreme Court hearing, and Tim talked a lot about that. And then the third one came just last week during the election. So um, we might say that the ACA is here to stay, but so far it's been a warm-up act. We really, now it has to work. And there is some question about how will the public receive it? Will individuals get health insurance? Will the employers accept it? 
A recent survey from eHealth Insurance suggests that 78% of small business owners said they were not familiar with the ACA and what it meant for them. That's a very large percentage of small business owners who we anticipate would go to the exchanges and get health insurance for their employees. So the slide above suggests that words have meanings as well as desired effects. In 1985, former Governor Mario Cuomo uh, of New, uh, New York, former Governor of New York, the father of the current governor, said, you campaign in poetry, you govern in prose. And that makes sense, because if you think about, we've just come out of a, a political campaign, and what did we hear from our candidates? We heard ideals. We heard about a government that could be, that we might, that we would want, that we would desire to have. But what we have now is the real difficult job of governing or policy making. And as the president welcomes the 113th Congress in January, there will be some roadblocks for the ACA. There are many, many, many Republicans in the House that still would love for it to go away. Uh, there will continue to be legal challenges. Um, and uh, with the sequestration and the fiscal cliff among us, it's very possible they will turn to the ACA to fund part of deficit reduction. These will all be difficult for us to um, deal with for those of us who want the ADA, ACA to go forward as it is. But for right now, it survives. Uh, we can hope that the old adage that politics is the art of the possible will mean that the implementation of the ACA will bring forward um, uh, what we would like to see in our healthcare system. And, and I think that is a fairer system, one that's more affordable, one that's higher quality for all Americans, and with a recognition for those who care for them, many of you in the audience. So for now, the ACA survives, and all I can say is, I just wish we could do something about filibuster reform. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I think actually uh, at a time like this when there's a lot of work to get started, it's really good to have had this kind of consolidated summary of where we've, where we've come from and where we are right now. So thank you both. We have a few minutes for your questions and comments. There will be two mics circulating in the auditorium. When you make your comment or question, please identify yourself. My name is Matt Thomas. I'm uh, in the pediatrics department. Just wondering if you guys could share your thoughts on the company's CEOs that have spoken out recently saying that they plan on laying people off as a result of uh, the ACA or Obamacare. Well, one of the big questions under the ACA is what will happen to our current insurance system, which is largely employment-based. Um, and there have been some surveys in which, uh, the most famous of which was a McKinsey survey about a year ago, where they just go out and say, what are you going to do? And they say, oh, I guess I'll stop insuring my employees and let the government do it. Um, the GAO put out a study um, uh, a, a couple of months ago in which they looked at all of the studies that have been done. And the consensus pretty much is that the employment-based insurance system will continue pretty much as it is. Um, all of the reasons that employers now have to ensure their employees continue to exist, um, and there will now be an additional reason, when, that is if you don't insure and they go to the exchange, you're going to have to be a penalty for large employers. Some small employers with very low wage uh, uh, workforces <coughs> will probably um, uh, drop insurance for their employees and let them go to the exchange. But the average employee makes more than 400% of poverty and would not be eligible for subsidies. And if you look at the math, uh, you lose so much in terms of the tax subsidies that are currently there. I mean, our third largest health insurance program in the United States is the employment tax subsidy, uh, which pays 30 to 50% of the cost of, of employees' health insurance from the federal government. Uh, now, the, 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 the people who've been saying this are fast food uh, uh, franchises. 
uh, or um, restaurants. Um, apparently, we have the idea in the United States that everyone has a constitutional right to a dollar hamburger and, um, and that the people who are going to provide those hamburgers for them are not entitled to either a living wage or health insurance. Uh, uh, and if we believe that, we're, uh, it's a problem uh, because we may not continue <laughs> to operate. Uh, but people have done the math, and you know, if we're willing to pay, I, I saw the figures this morning, I forget them, but 15 cents more per pizza or something, the people who work for those restaurants can have health insurance. And frankly, it's worth it to me. Um, but, I mean, I think that there will be some employers, in particular in, in, food, in, uh, in, in food and in retail, that are going to say, I can't afford it, and will probably find some way to get around offering it, which might involve cutting back on labor. But they have to have somebody back there to make those burgers. So uh, I don't think it's going to completely destroy the, the, the job. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm John Aris. I, I'm in the Hi. Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the Division of Public Health Sciences and Philosophy. Um, so I tend to think of health reform as a two-edged sword. On the one hand, you've got quest for increased access to care, uh, which is supposed to be achieved by all the means you described just now, but also to contain costs in order to make that expansion supportable and sustainable. So we haven't heard much today about that latter aspect. You know, really briefly, you know, first of all, what do you think are the major cost containment elements? And what do you think about the, the, their likelihood of actually working in the present environment where so many tax breaks are given for private health insurance and fee-for-service medicine continues to reign? Well, there are dozens of, uh, of ideas as to how to contain costs in the Affordable Care Act. Many of them uh, focused on the Medicare program. There's the Center for Medicare uh, Innovation, and basically, uh, it, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and basically what the statute says is, here are 20 ideas that people have written about in health affairs in the last 10 years on how to save money. See if any of them work. Um, and so, uh, bundled payments, of course, the, the, the big focus is on, on shared savings, the accountable care organization. Um, in, the, in the insurance reforms, the idea is to, to sharpen competition among insurers in the hopes that, that they will then, it's the old idea of managed competition, that they will then try to bring down health care costs. Um, the, uh, there's, of course, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, which, if it ever happens, is supposed to make sure that help Medicare costs go down. Um, what you don't have uh, is price controls in the private sector. Um, I mean, the other, the other thing that's in there, frankly, is what, uh, what conservatives have been asking for for a long time is higher cost sharing. The cost sharing in the <coughs> Affordable Care Act, in the average employer health plan is something like 85% actuarial value. The standard exchange plan is going to be 70% actuarial value. And I think most people are going to be very disappointed to see how much they're going to have to spend out of their own pockets to get medical care, including probably a lot of providers, because a lot of that's going to become bad debt. Um, but uh, there aren't any magic bullets in there, but most of the ideas that have been floated out there for trying to control costs are in the legislation. Uh, and in the end, that is the most important problem, because if we can't control costs, we can't guarantee access. John, I'll just briefly uh, mention that um, I think I think the the biggest cost containment mechanism will be the change in the way we pay physicians, moving away from a fee for service payment system to uh, bundled payment, global cap sorts of things, because that actually shifts the incentives 180 degrees. You know, 95 cents of Every dollar we spend on health care in this country goes towards the organization and financing of medical care. And I think that you'll find that that, over time, if it's allowed to go forward in that way, will really reduce the spending growth trajectory. 
I'm afraid that we have come to the end of our hour. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have more time for your questions and comments. But I hope that this has given you a lot to mull over and actually shown you what to be looking for as the work goes ahead and the debate goes on. We will see you in 2013. Thank you so much. Thanks.